Hey, we're live. Welcome to Sci Chat. And Jen, how are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing good. And welcome to Dr. Callum Cooper. How are you doing today? I'm very well, thank you. Sounds like you're both doing good as well. We are. We're yeah. hanging in there. Still working from home, but doing well. Yeah. So um, it's great you could join us today. We're really looking forward to speaking with you for the next hour or so. And I just want to read your bio and then we'll get off and running. Sure thing. All right. Dr. Cooper is a chartered psychologist with the British Psychological Society and a fellow at the Higher Education Academy, holding postgraduate degrees in psychology, social science, research methods, and education uh, from the University of Northampton, Sheffield, Hallam University, and Manchester Metropolitan University. He is currently based in the Faculty of Health, Education, and Society at the University of Northampton, and he lectures on parapsychology and exceptional experiences, thanatology, positive psychology, and sexual behavior. He is a council member of the Society for Psychical Research and a professional member of the Parapsychological Association. So welcome to the show, and believe me, we are thrilled to have you here today, and we have a lot of different topics we'd like to discuss and lots of questions. Fantastic. Let's see how much we can get done in an hour. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see how efficient we can be in an hour. <laughs> so great. Um, so starting off, how did you get interested in parapsychology? Okay, so um, I live in Nottingham, even though I commute to Northampton to work at the University of Northampton. Um, I, I've stayed within uh, the Nottinghamshire area. It's it's vast. You've got Nottingham City and where Nottingham Castle is, and then the Nottinghamshire area spans so wide in the Midlands. So um, I'm close to the area called uh, Mansfield that starts to border into Yorkshire and places like that. So you're starting to get further. I'm I'm north of the wall, so <laughs> proper <laughs> northern. Okay, and. Um, I, uh, I I went to school locally, a um, place called Lama School, and every week we'd have trips to walk down to the local library. It was a done thing then because our library at the school was about five shelves. And so we'd all get our library cards and things like that, and we could take out books. Um, but I'd always go to this one section with friends where we'd read all kinds of books on Fortean phenomena, so stuff that was looking at UFOs, Bigfoot, the Loch Ness Monster, and so forth. And then there was stuff on haunting phenomena and psychic abilities. And um, there weren't many books, probably about 10, but we'd always just go and look at them because there were some fantastic pictures in there, alleged photographs of ghosts and then classic ones of Bigfoot and Loch Ness Monster. And I, th I think I always got really intrigued as to, you know, what's going on within these experiences? What's actually happened in that photograph? What are we actually seeing rather than what we're told that we're seeing? Um, and so it was always just an interest between friends. Obviously, within the curriculum, with what I was doing at school up to the age of 16, this kind of stuff wouldn't really come up. You'd have a few teachers that were interested in it, but there's no way that you could really write about it, except for maybe a fictional story for English, and certainly wouldn't really come into science, um, not in that kind of level. So I started to play with it a bit more when I got onto college for two years. That's between the 16 to 18 years for, we call it, sixth form. And um, I did psychology there. And there was a couple of psychology tutors that were interested and others that said, look, you know, if you want to get involved in parapsychology, you know, running about in the dark with cameras and things like that, I should warn you now, there is no such thing as a parapsychologist. And I said, but really, that's interesting because I know hundreds of parapsychologists. I've, I've read the literature and, you know, read of the universities they work at and what they've done. And this particular psychologist had quite a blinkered view and only wanted me to get through my exams and just go to a local university, which ironically now that local university they named um, does parapsychology. It has its <laughs> psychology department and I know the parapsychologist there very well. Um, but I, I'd been dabbling with performing arts and things like that. I'd done a, a lot of filmmaking at college as well and photography. And I'd always got a passion for the stage. I, I wanted to do theatre and things like that. Um, but th there were so many things telling me, look, there are hundreds of people at this college doing that kind of stuff. Get a degree in something that could be applied to many things. If someone sees you with a degree in psychology, it could be used for a number of things. Um, so go down that route. So I, I looked for that. I was quite interested in human behavior and also um, the mind-body problem and things like that. 
and realized that there were quite a few universities in the UK alone that were doing parapsychology. So I went to look at various ones and I just felt really at home at Northampton. By that point, it was the largest research center for parapsychology and still is. They started parapsychology there in 1998. And uh, I've stayed there ever since. Um, from what you've read in the bio, I've been to different places and collaborated with different universities, still do with Manchester Metropolitan University that gets 100 students every year doing parapsychology in their undergraduate curriculum. Um, but I'm, I'm module coordinating uh, parapsychology at Northampton. We see about 50 to 60 students every year and quite a handful of par um, parapsychology PhD students as well. Ooh. Oh, excellent. Well, it's good to know that they're still doing that and they still have formal training and education there. Um, that's dropped off fairly... Is almost to zero in the U.S. It, it's done like that. I mean, if the U.S. was yeah. the upper hand, it's done that over the time against the U.K. I mean, there's mm -hmm. probably th three universities at best that are doing parapsychology. The University of West Georgia, especially with Dr. Christine Simmons Moore. Right. And that's where the, the William Roll archive is there, along mm -hmm. with several other archives. Um, Duke University still has the Rhine um, archive there. And just down the road is the Rhine Research Center as well. So even though they don't really acknowledge parapsychology there, they've got a lot of theses in their library and their archive system. So they still tip their hat to it and things like that. It's just a shame that it's it's dropped dropped off the curriculum, not because of the, the thorough practice involved in the science, but just because of assumptions about it more than anything. It seems more effort to actually sit down and educate people and get it into the curriculum again in the USA um, right. than it, it, you know, than it does. It's, people just see it as an effort. So ah, just knock it to one side, parapsychology nonsense. Right. That's unfortunate, but, you know, you can go keep writing. It will be back go overseas and get educated. <laughs> so, great. So moving into the first topic after death communication, you've done a fair amount of research on that. We've watched a couple of your presentations. I think some of them were at the Parapsychological Association meeting. Uh, and there has been a recent uh, research findings report that came out, the investigation of the phenomenology and impact of spontaneous and direct after after death communications, which you uh, were one of the co-authors. And I was just wondering to start us off, if you could tell us a little bit about what you did with, with that study and that report and what's in there. You've been very thorough. <laughs> um, <laughs> with, with that, um, my, my first PhD was in after death communications to some extent. I was uh, mainly looking at bereavement and recovery. And I wanted to look at various things that helped along the way. And with that um, led to acknowledgement of what psychical research had done. So you have the Society for Psychical Research that formed in 1882 off the back of the rise of spiritualism and um, various things going on, mediumship and increased reports of apparitions in alleged haunted houses. So a group of scholars got together um, at Trinity College, University of Cambridge and formed the SPR to look into these claims. And a couple of years later, the American branch formed as well with many eminent scientists, including the psychologist, William James. Um, and a lot of the stuff that they were looking at was essentially after death communications. Um, they brought out a, a two volume book called Phantasms of the Living, which was a really large scale survey looking at various spontaneous pe experiences people had had. And then in about 1889, they brought out the census of hallucinations in volume 10 of the proceedings. And that was a survey, postal survey, even then that went out to 17,000 people with um, just over 10,000 people responding. Um, and so it was really impactful at the time. And within that, at least 10% of the people had said that they'd had sense of presence experiences. The thing is, even though it was done within the context of psychical research, you can look through various religious, philosophical and early psychology texts and find some suggestion of people reporting a sense of presence. Sigmund Freud had um, dismissed it within a few lines, even in his 12 volume works as saying that it was just um, a form of psychotic delusions that people might start to have these and hanging on too much. But some of them can go from sense of presence to smelling people, hearing them, feeling their touch, dreaming about them, poltergeist type activity, seeing them, and, and many other things, symbolic experiences as well. So it was William Derry Rees, 1971, was a medical doctor, um, he wanted to do an MD thesis to look into this. He was already a practicing um, GP, general, general practitioner. Um, so he'd already got the title of doctor, but he, he wanted a research degree to get acknowledgement amongst the research community. And he brought out this kind of groundbreaking paper for the British Medical Journal that was part of his thesis called Hallucinations of Widowhood and found that over 50% of people that suffer bereavement report these experiences. 
So that was the largest scale survey at the time. That was 293 widows and widowers interviewed. We mm. wanted to bring that up to date. And so with places like the Scientific and Medical Network, uh, we hooked up with colleagues in Geneva um, who were interested in this. And we said, well, look, we've just been doing this as you know, a large thing for a thesis where I was looking at things like the emotion of hope. And these experiences giving people what they sensed as hope about moving forward and goal attainment and the experience giving them something to hang on to like an anchor and then drive forward after that it's really grounding themselves during this uh, period of loss and giving them something to facilitate the gap and so uh, and we call that a, a continued spiritual bond um, so with that we said well let's do this on a, a larger scale and look at different cultures and look at overall the phenomenology and how different it is so in in other words, the characteristics, do they differ from country to country or are they pretty much the same? When we sent out the survey in French, English and Spanish, we got just over a thousand people responding. And this survey took about 40 to 45 minutes to fill in. It was so detailed because we had really long sections on hearing things, smelling mm -hmm. things, feeling touch and things like that. With remarkably only about three or four of those questionnaires being bogus, where people had spent all that time just filling in stupid responses, which we call frivolous cases. It happens with any survey where someone sees it on the internet and they feel, well, they've got nothing better to do but to fill it in with silly answers, thinking that it will spoil the survey. It really doesn't, because most people will be quite genuine in, in their responses and take a lot of time to, to fill out written responses. Um, so with that, we found a number of things. We're having to break it down. We have done um, a summary on just all the, the uh, quantitative findings, so all the main numbers of, you know, so many of this and so many of that, mm -hmm. that we're trying to look for a high-impact journal to go for. It's likely that instead of the British Medical Journal, again, we might try and get it in a journal called The Lancet, mm -hmm. which is um, very noted. And then after that, we've got to look at things like the sense of presence experience, dreaming of the dead, smelling them, hearing them, all these different subcategories that could be at least 12, 13, 14 different papers. It's going to take us about 10 years to systematically break the survey down and get it out into different journals and disseminate it. And not just parapsychology. There's a few instances where we're interested in messages received, where that person shouldn't have known about those messages, but the dead has delivered something that's quite unique that the person's had to follow up on or a group of people seeing the apparition of a deceased person, yet only one person within the group is in fact bereaved. So why would the other people see it as well? Mm -hmm. They're of interest to parapsychology, certainly, because we've got something that goes beyond um, typical um, side effects of bereavement, but all the others will go after nursing journals, death, dying and bereavement journals, you name it. So we brought everything up to date. Okay. Okay, great. Um, in, in your survey, I noticed that you had a category called other. Now, um, by by chance, were there any like pet uh, ADCs or anything like that that you had experienced or saw? So, some people, um, given the chance, I mean, there were some instances where we, we said, look, we're so limited for how much we can analyze. Can you just give us your most recent or most significant experience? And mm. they wouldn't. They would just write everything oh. <laughs> down and they'd take every chance. So that they'd talk about the, the first experience they had since the loss of that person, then what was more significant after that. And then they'd say, oh, out of interest, I had these as well. So, yes, absolutely. People have had them of pets where um, if they've had a cat, they'll be washing the pots in the kitchen. And at the corner of their eye, they see the cat hop up onto the counter and uh, look over and then it's not gone. It, it's gone. But if they just stayed focused, which they sometimes do for some time, they can see it moving about quite distinctly, even through to dogs. Um, I've known some really rare instances of people reporting hamsters as well. <laughs> wow. like that, gerbils. Um, <laughs> And I've read that as well. In there's a brilliant book by Raymond Bayless called Animal Ghosts, okay. um, where he he trawled through many many different books to look for instances of this. But certainly people okay. have those. And then death, dying, and bereavement journals will talk about pet cemeteries mm -hmm. and also people's experiences um, with pets following loss. It's it's not that well written about, but there is it is out there. So following the same kind of uh, questioning here. So were they? Um, did did you notice if any of them had? Um, like dreams of their pets or were these just straight viewing them from in the daytime when they're walking around and such or was this um i guess that's my question was it more was any dream related ones where they have dreamt about their animal certainly with after death communications in general dreams are one of the most popular scenarios in which people have experiences and they say mm -hmm. that that dream is unlike any other it was more real, it was more interactive, and it was hard to tell the difference between being awake and being asleep when they did wake up, um, especially with people. Um, I can't quote or specifically name anything from this 
a recent survey. But certainly I've no doubt that people have had dreams about their deceased pets um, within them. And then they might wake to feel something jumping on the bed, which they'd take to be that cat or the dog. And that's what's brought them um, you know, back to reality again. Um, same as people going to sleep and feeling someone sitting on the end of the bed and looking at them. So they they do happen in, in those okay. um, scenarios. And just, I guess, one more related to this real quickly. Um, <laughs> have, um, Covering have for the of, animal lovers today. <laughs> <laughs> have you heard of anything um, of the animals actually speaking in their dreams, speaking to the person in like uh, English or whatever their language is? No, but um, a lot of the times when people have a waking or dream state interaction with a uh, deceased person, they'll usually say that their mouth was closed okay. throughout the whole thing. And they, but they're having a conversation. They say it was just as distinct as hearing our voices now as we have this dialogue. But it was up here. Okay. It was what they could only describe as a telepathic communication where both parties knew exactly what each other meant and they could hear the conversation playing out. So um, I certainly, besides the bizarre case of Harry Price investigating Jeff the talking mongoose <laughs> back in the 1930s, um, I, I haven't really heard of anything where people claim that they've had any communication like that with a pet during an ADC. That's digging even deeper into the pet ADC category sure. for me. Um, but I, I bet if you look, there might be something like that. It just makes me think mainly if, if people are interested in this and the, the ESP side side of um, animals, um, there's a brilliant book by Dr. Rupert Sheldrake called Dogs That Know When Their Owners Are Coming Home. Oh, okay. And uh, it talks about a variety of phenomena, um, including a, a telepathic parrot that lives in New oh. York City. Um, if it's not in there, the telepathic parrot is also discussed in his book, The Sense of Being Stared At, which mm. is also quite interesting mm. for animals as well because of hunting instincts. And when you see that lioness in the long grass hunting the gazelle and the gazelle's eating, then suddenly looks up and goes. Okay. But there's nothing to indicate anything's there. But can we see this primal instinct in animals as well when they know they're being tracked? They know they're being stared at. So does it transfer through to humans as well? Okay. okay. Great. Follow-up question. So do you think that, looking at the impacts and then trying to publish in the mainstream medical and scientific journals, do you think that's going to bring some more legitimacy to just studying these type of experiences? As I, I noticed recently, instead of terminal lucidity, there was a recent article and they're, they're calling it paradoxal lucidity. Kind of like, oh, the medical mm -hmm. community is finally taking note and like, hey, guess what? We're going to look at this, but we're going to give it a more medical sounding terminology. And it seems even with some of the skeptical uh, people I interact with, when you show them that article versus one out of a parapsychology journal called Terminal Lucidity, it seems mm. to bring more legitimacy. Do you think that's going to help uh, studying these type of experiences? It's interesting that you bring that up because I'm not one for going on social media and looking at a comment that I don't like and then starting to get into a brawl. But a couple of weeks ago, when I started seeing the news and some of the um, Black Lives Matter protests had turned into riots in some places, usually, you know, by the vast majority of people that weren't really interested in Black Lives Matter, they just wanted a riot and uh, were causing this anarchy. Um, I, I just got so annoyed seeing it and some of the damage to statues that I felt were completely irrelevant to what people were we're talking about especially war memorials and things like that and i just thought god you know the, the world is you know it's so damaged right now and this is a reaction for being locked up so long well we've, we've been in lockdown and this is you know one of the releases because something's happened in social media and people have jumped on it it's, it's not even a new issue it's just one that's existed for a long time that's needed dealing with and and so i was just going through the internet that night and i saw on a, a group on facebook about consciousness someone had just put a question is there any good evidence for ESP? Just asking. And I thought, well, I'm, I'm going to get involved in this. And, <laughs> and I did. And I kind of presented, you know, these are where some of the good cases are that are actually good summaries of all of the evidence for it. And there were some really hostile people in there. I'm a skeptical activist and I go out talking about conventional explanations for things and why we need skepticism in science as a whole. Right. And the, the kind of reactions that I got were from people that we call dogmatic skeptics or even um, cynics. Mm -hmm. where they, they like to label themselves as skeptics. But to start mm -hmm. with the, the position of it doesn't exist, it's nonsense, is not a skeptical position. That's instant no. dismissal based on belief or prior experiences mm -hmm. where you're enforcing emotion on it. And uh, out of many things where I was trying to defend myself and they said, oh, once you've got a degree, you'll realize superstitious nonsense doesn't exist. And I said, well, I realized that after my first <laughs> the way, degree. I, and then, 
I have a doctorate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, three after that, and then two doctorates as well. So you know, I, I'm aware of that. And then they said, oh, you know, you can, any monkey can get um, a degree off the internet in parapsychology. You know, I bet it only uh... took two weeks. My doctorate's going to take nine years. And I said, well, one of mine took nine years. The other took five years. So what's your point? <laughs> the longer it takes, the better it is. Mm-hmm. I don't understand. And then they went, but the quality aspect, he then turned to um, impact factor. And it's important for universities because it gives a status as a university that the more impact you can get, the more it looks good for us as a research department. Mm -hmm. Does it suggest good quality? No, it's about when you get something in a high impact journal is how many times it's recited and picked up by other places as well or gets into the media. And -hmm. then it will highlight your university as well. Psychology is in the wrong area of science itself for impact factor. Most psychology journals at best have an impact factor about two, maybe three. Mm-hmm. And parapsychology, there's only a couple of journals that even have an impact factor. The other ones, things like the Journal of the Society for Psycho Research, they've been refused impact. They've mm-hmm. got a long-standing reputation, mm-hmm. eminent sciences, uh, scientists involved, good methodology, good oh. peer review process, just not allowed to be on the impact ladder. Mm-hmm. Um, Journal of Parapsychology has 0.5 about that. Um, and so it's really low down. So a lot of people will think, well, then the research is rubbish, as this guy's argument was. It's, you know, what poor quality research. And I, you're basing that just on the impact factor. Have you even read any of the papers in it? Do you mm-hmm. know how long it takes to get a paper mm-hmm. in there once you've gone through peer review? It's right. just as rigorous mm-hmm. as the other journals. But it's, I don't think we'll win anyone on that kind of argument. You have to kind of put across a good case. I, I think people misunderstand impact factors. Right. And um, it's the wrong direction of argument to go in, really. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, one other question, and then we got one from the chat room here. Um, I noticed uh, as I was going through the uh, report that uh, you use plus or minus 24 hours to consider an after death communication. And I think some of the older literature use plus or minus 12 hours. Is there anything you want with the 24 versus the 12 that historically had been done? I think that's more. Sorry. Yeah, You're referring so to a, the crisis apparition. Crisis yeah, apparition. Crisis, Sorry. Sorry. So yes, yes. That's Thank more for, um, a, a typo of, of that being an abstract for a conference presentation that's just snuck in there. Okay. It was typical that you have the 12 hours leading up, then the point of death, and then the 12 hours afterwards. So that crisis period is the 24 hours surrounding the moment Strong. of death. However, one of the first things, one of the first papers besides this big one that we're getting out, I'm having to work on the crisis paper and, and all the crisis okay. cases within it. And we're going back to that. I mean, I've um, where are they? Uh, they're just down there and I've got a few stacked up here that are all to do with some of the early comments Mm. Um, even before the Society for Psychical Research and saying where did this definition come from because it's a bit it's a little bit weak really because what about 16 hours afterwards or 17 hours afterwards why doesn't that count or 17 hours before? Yeah it seems like they had to pick a cut off somewhere Yeah and you get so many cases as we have done that are a few hours beyond that or maybe even a day so at what point do you say that well that's not of interest to being some sort of crisis where someone is reaching out and saying to someone that they're dying and then it turns out that they've died Mm -hmm. if they even do that three days before that person dies and that relative has no idea and then finds out the person died three days afterwards i still think that's an interesting exchange Mm -hmm. going on oh yeah and and should be part of the crisis so i think we actually need to smash down that 12 hour period and say to be honest really you know the jury's out we can open this up a little bit more and and scoop in some other cases that seem to satisfy the Mm -hmm. description but not necessarily the time period. Right. Okay, good, interesting. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. I'm going to put a question up from okay. Cat Ward. Um, do you feel Do you feel Myers, Gary, Tara were correct in their appraisal of apparitional experiences being telepathic? It's certainly an interesting debate and one that I'd kind of argue more towards. There's a a new book coming out. There's been several um, anthologies on life after death research. There was a really good one that was off the back of a conference that Eileen Garrett, who uh, founded the Parapsychology Foundation in 1951. She was a well-tested medium, uh, wanted other uh, mediums and psychics to come forward and have themselves tested if they really believed in their claim. And she produced um, a, a book called Does Man Survive? And then there was um, another good one by Gary Dore, I think it was, in 1990, called What Survives. Then Lance Storm and Michael Thalborn, 2006. It was Survival of... Oh, there it is. Not far away, this one. <laughs> the Survival of Human Consciousness, as well. So there's another anthology there mm-hmm. with some really good ideas. Um, and there's a the latest one. And we wanted to make sure... I'm not involved in the editing, but I, I heard a lot of the discussions around it. I'm contributing a paper on site experiences in the funeral industry. And um, 
there was a need for skepticism, a whole chapter that breaks down the skepticism. But I've always done that within my writings of it, saying, let's start with the conventional explanations for it and then lead towards this whole idea of mind surviving after death and what good evidence is actually left once we have separated the wheat from the chaff. Mm. And I think the, the ideas by Myers, Gurney and Tyrrell are right in the middle and more plausible and would satisfy most of the parapsychologists because not many follow um, this whole idea of survival anymore. It's kind of an, an idea that a lot of psychical researchers still hold to, and certainly the SPR still has a committee that researches it. I'm on it because I'm interested in research surrounding it. But this whole idea that, well, if someone isn't surviving after death, once you're gone, that's it. Body, mind has gone. This mind was part of body. That's it. Gone, gone, gone. Mm -hmm. But traces of it might either get captured somehow in other people's memory, or you know, if there's something that we might call a psi field, um, we have all kinds of things. We have infrared, we have ultraviolet, we have radio waves, we have many different things, invisible fields that we walk around. Maybe there's a psi field. Rupert Sheldrake has talked about morphic fields with morphic resonance and more a biological mm. thing about how each plant life or animal learns from the next generation, but through its own genes and this transfer in this field. And um, so this idea that maybe if you've got a group of people seeing an apparition, it's not the apparition generating itself and some evidence of someone surviving, but someone has projected this hallucination and group suggestion has taken over and everyone else is then taking on the hallucination as well. So they can see it. And it becomes interesting when you look at those collective reports and you ask people, well, what did you see? And in some instances, everyone saw the apparition face on, even if one person's in front and one's behind, which suggests it's more of a hallucination that people are picking up on. But there's a lot of kind of overlapping memories there's a lot of bleeding in how people record it if you don't separate them instantly and ask them to write their own independent report mm -hmm. it, it's like when you look at um eyewitness testimony to car accidents and the police take you to one side and they say did you see the stop sign or did you see a stop sign one implies you know was there or wasn't there one when you were there did you see one and the other one says there is one there but did you see it the and uh make a big difference in the questioning as to how someone recalls something. And I think in some of these early testimonies, we ha might have some of these overlaps. But I, I'm more inclined to agree with their idea of we're generating these experiences. They're not necessary mm. survival, though there does seem to be some good cases that suggest something, information that was known to that deceased person has survived. It doesn't mean that they've you know survived in terms of conscious awareness and this disembodied consciousness somehow roaming the earth in some way. Um, but it just means that that memory in some way has not gone to to waste. There's philosophical ideas about it called transmigration and metempsychosis. Mm -hmm. So the, there's all kinds of theories that kind of plant around for this, but that would be my answer. Okay. Nice. Very nice. Okay, interesting. All right. Jen, do you have anything more on the after <gasps> Um Yeah, um, I guess I was curious as to... Um, uh, do you have any like hypotheses on um, maybe why a deceased person may, um, I know we were talking about um, lucidity and the tr or transliminality, um, but why a deceased person could would contact one person rather than another? Um, could it be, like I said, could it be due to transliminality somehow? Or could it possibly be the relationship that the deceased had with the experience? Question. <laughs> Who knows? Um, I mean, there's so many different versions. You get people that have apparitions of deceased people that they don't even know. And in telling people about their remarkable instance of seeing a ghost, someone might then say, oh, my God, that's my Uncle Gary. He died a week ago. You never met him. I never even told you about him. Mm. Uh, you know, so those ones happen. You get some people or in a family unit where everyone's bereft, but then there's one person that wasn't particularly close to that person. They have the experience and they tell other people and they're quite annoyed um, because they didn't have the experience. And they were the ones that were every day just wishing they could have that last goodbye and wish they hadn't ended on a bad note or wish they'd shook their hand or hugged them or kissed them before they, they uh, had their last kind mm. of face to face interaction. In some of those instances, like uh, Dr. Julian Burton, who did one of the early PhDs on this, um, his mother had died um, in the 70s. And um, it was nine months after she died, he recounts being in the kitchen. He was entertaining some guests and he got into the kitchen to cut up a pineapple. And he thought someone was behind him. He thought it was his wife coming in to pass him a bowl. And he turned to look and whoever it was then went behind him and passed the other side. So he had to then turn the other way again and saw his mother standing there. And he said mm -hmm. she looked 10 years younger than she did when she died. 
Um, so maybe she passed away. It was either, you know, she looked elderly or she passed away from something that had really, you know, um, taken away her physical features, like, you know, going to the full length of cancer and people becoming very wasted away in skeletal. Mm -hmm. um, but he said she was vibrant. She looked 10 years younger, but she was wearing a pale blue detail gown that I'd never seen before. But he was just so shocked. And he said, all of a sudden, it just dissolved. It didn't disappear. She dissolved away. And I think it was the next day he spoke to his sister and told her about the experience. And she was distraught. She was crying on the phone. And um, he said that was because she wanted the experience, not him. She was closer to mother. But then he described how mother looked. And she was like, well, that's it. That's my message for me. About a few weeks before she died, uh, we'd gone clothes shopping together, as we regularly did. And she'd seen... Um, a gown that she wanted but it was something like four or five hundred dollars and she didn't want to part with that much money just for this particular gown but she was so tempted to treat herself and she said that's my message that's the wing to the shopping trips and the fact that in the afterlife I've got this gown mm -hmm. um, and so you get those things but I have no idea why one person that doesn't even know the deceased person compared to someone that was really close to the person has these experiences they seem to be very naturally spontaneous because you have absolute believers of the paranormal through to complete cynics who have mocked other people's experiences mm -hmm. just suddenly looking up and then seeing something or having an experience you you're just in the right place at the right time okay and have you noticed any um time periods like um like maybe the mother maybe has have have they be able to come at any time like 20 years later after death or is it limited to only a certain time frame? Many researchers like uh, Derry Rees and then even through to Elenda Haraldson that more recently had combined many of his uh, studies together in a book called Departed Among the Living, which came out in 2012. Um, and he'd shown that after a, a 10 year period or so, Myers and Gurney had found that there was a decline after a year. But most researchers that were looking into this had said that within 10 years, they start to decline. But within my own sample, and certainly this more recent survey, um, I can certainly say from my own sample, I found someone that had reported things two years afterwards, one was 30 years and another was 32 years. So people can go many, many years without ever having any kind of experience, then all of a sudden something happened. And when I re read those uh, ones of 30 years and 32 years, those people weren't thinking about the deceased. Again, they were just doing their daily thing and then something mm -hmm. happened. And it wasn't just um, something symbolic where, you know, a song came on on the radio and they said, oh, that was their favorite song. And then they started to feel their presence. Sure. It'd be more so the radio went off in the car. They felt <laughs> that person sat next to them. And then the radio came back on, suddenly playing that person's favorite song mm. that they played mm. at their funeral or something like that, which they found really strange. And yet we've had this 30 year period going on. So th those are interesting. They do occur. Okay. 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 Interesting. All right. So I guess time to move on to the next topic. Um, telephone calls from the dead. So you've done some work in that area as well. Um, so I think one of the, the videos we dug up uh, may have been a while ago, you described five different types. Mm -hmm. What are those? And what are some of the differences between them? So they remain the same and they're very closely linked to the the after death communications because in any of these surveys they've come up and in omega the journal of death and dying when i've looked at some previous bereavement studies um even dream studies as well people have reported having um telephone calls within them as well did you hear that scream in the background just then you did. <laughs> is that your child <laughs> yeah. no one being murdered that's my daughter in the background who's oh. 22 months <laughs> she oh. must be watching um, no one yeah everyone's safe everyone's safe. And, and um i've had that a lot today with meetings at work mm. and stuff and just trying to do zoom meetings then all of a sudden no one can hear anything i'm saying because there's a scream right in my face that's the new um, yeah. It's the new norm. <laughs> Everyone accepts it. Um, and so Rogo and Bayless, D. Scott Rogo, Raymond Bayless, they were well known in parapsychology. They weren't formal academics. Scott Rogo's background, he had a degree in music and dropped it all to focus on parapsychology. Became so well noted, he was a faculty member at John F. Kennedy University teaching on their master's degree. And Raymond Bayless was a, um, a landscape artist and had done paintings for H.P. Lovecraft as well. H.P. Uh, Lovecraft? Didn't that? Don't know if those initials right. Lovecraft, anyway. Whether I've got those first initials right or not, you may have seen Lovecraft's work and um, the, the whole War of the Worlds things, yep. and he did a lot of paintings for that. And uh, they're, they're remarkable to see. I've got a couple of Raymond's uh, paintings; they're beautiful. Um, but they were both 
fully dedicated psychical researchers. They'd spent a lot of time doing um, traditional field investigations, but Scott had done lab studies as well. And uh, one of the books that they looked into following um, EVP research, because really in the, the kind of formalities of parapsychology, Raymond Bayliss was the discoverer of EVP and had written about it, published about it in the um, Journal of the American SPR. Um, but it had gone unnoticed. Then you got figures cropping up like Frederick Jurgensen, who's sometimes noted as being the discoverer when he wasn't. It was some nine months later, and because he got more publicity behind him and he knew people because he worked in the film industry, he got recognized for it. And then later, Dr. Constantine Raudover with the book Re uh, Breakthrough. Um, but while they were doing this research, they had a few people come to them and say, oh, that sounds interesting. Maybe you'd be interested in this rather than recording voices, hearing them live on the telephone. Here's the story I heard. Um, and they didn't really take note of it, but they had more and more people come forward and mention them. So by 1977, they started to collect them and they collected 50 cases. They trawled through journals. They trawled through books to find other cases besides the ones that were written and sent to them. And they wrote a book called Phone Calls from the Dead uh, that I suppose was the most popular book that Scott had ever written, really. It ran for about three or four different editions where they just reprinted it. And... Um, so uh, when I was an undergraduate, I found this book and I read it and then I didn't really take any notice of it until a train collision had happened in California where a guy called Charles Peck had been involved and he was traveling home to his family, I guess commuting after work. And it was a commuter train with a freight train that had derailed and both had hit and they'd spent all night, the rescue services, trying to get people off the train. His phone was um, calling family repeatedly and every time they picked up, it was just static. And if they called back, it would just go to um, answer phone. Mm. And his body was found at 3 a.m. and it was the same time that the calls had stopped. But the main point of that that sparked my interest was the media had put it across as a phone call from the dead. And I thought, well, mobile phones, text messages, emails, we've got that now. It was 2009. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought, what's actually changed in all that time? So I started to collect more cases. I, I read about it more. And um, Raymond Bayliss and Scott Rogo, they got four different types of cases. I argued that maybe there's another one that mixes the first two. So you've got simple calls, type one, you know someone's died, and then the telephone rings, you pick it up, you hear their voice or they say your voice, but you can hear their characteristics, you know it's that deceased person and their voice fades out, they're very unresponsive. You don't hear the click of the, the phone going back down on the receiver. Type two, you don't know that person's died and yet they call, you have a half hour conversation, they're very final about some things. Uh, projects you're working on, telling you to carry on with it and finish it off. You're doing such a good job. Phone goes down, knock, knock at the door. Um, it's your friend Mary. Um, you know, did you hear about Barry? Well, I've just been speaking to Barry on the phone. You can't have been. Barry died yesterday in a car accident. And then shock horror, you realize the two things have happened when they shouldn't be. Sometimes when checking with the phone call company as well, there's no record of that call taking place at that time. Oh. And yet someone rang with Barry's voice characteristics, Barry's knowledge, and you know carried out a conversation like any other except for when you reflect on it you realize a lot of things were quite final uh type three would be um just a bit of a role reversal really you're not getting the call in you're making the call but two scenarios happen you get an answer from someone who has died but you're not aware of it so you have a half hour conversation similar scenario happens to the one i just mentioned or you get an answer from someone that you want to speak to that later on you find out was not home at the time that you made the call. And yet someone picked up with their voice and characteristics and knowledge and still carried out the call. And yet they're verified at that very time to have been elsewhere because when you meet them, they've got no knowledge of that call and can give evidence from other people, say, that they were somewhere else. So, you know, who answered the call? Um, Scott Rogo and Raymond Bayes, they had a few cases like that themselves where they could vouch for that kind of experience. Type four, I'm arguing that because of the cases that I found, there's a mix of type one and type two where you could be aware that someone's dead, but have repeated calls over time that last quite a long time. Mm. Uh, so there was a guy uh, later on in life who was a doctor of psychology and sociology. He remembers um, when he was 11 that his mum, after her partner had died, they had repeated calls for three years, two or three times a week from this guy. Mm. And she kept a five year long diary in which this three years worth of calls were noted. And they're just bizarre repeated information about Friday afternoon my darling called to say that he loved me and would be at my side mm -hmm. when I'm sad he comes to me on the phone and he comforts me and he says now you will be all right they're just very comforting words nothing specific but it's very weird because they said at the time we didn't know what to do with it because we didn't know about the SPR you can't ring the ambulance fire police service what are they going to do mm -hmm. you can't call the ghostbusters what, what are you going to do so they, they just they put up with it and they let it play out and then the type five intention calls 
you intend to call someone, but the time you do, you change your mind, and yet that person still receives the call through your intention. It's like apparitions of the living, where you intend to go somewhere, you don't, and someone says they saw you there. So the way this plays out, I can recall straight away from the, the book, which is now out of print. I need to update it. You can still get it from libraries if you order it. Yeah, we it found was... a copy somewhere online. It was like $900. Oh, oh, yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. Sorry. that They are all gone. I did it as a private print run, and they mm. they went over a seven-year period pretty quickly. I, I think most of them got posted out to the United States. I mm -hmm. think a lot of people got really interested in it. So okay. I should really update it and get a, a Kindle out of the original. It's, it's on my mm. list of many things to do. But the intention call. Scott said, uh, on Thursday morning, 10 o'clock, I thought about calling a colleague of mine at UCLA Neuropsychiatric Institute. But I decided to mark some papers instead for whatever reason. Four o'clock that afternoon, though, I got a surprise of my life when I got a call come in to me from the office of the very psychologist I'd thought about calling. It was her research assistant who said that he was answering my message. When I asked him Blazers what he was talking about, he said that at 10 o'clock that morning, a call had come in to them from me. The person had left my name and my number and asked that the call be returned. So that's how they play out. Wow, interesting. Well, there isn't any record though that you said in some of these, they, they couldn't they didn't show that there was a record of the call. Yeah, in, in some instances, uh, even though the information is not put across as clearly as I would like, I guess in some cases they say there's a record there, but it's just bizarre. It's a really weird one, or it's like someone in early days have somehow managed to withhold the number, suggesting it's a prank. But in other cases, mm -hmm. you've got every other recorded call except for that one. Okay. Uh, and this is what led to Scott Rogan and Raymond Bayless's idea that if it is anomalous, it's a self-generated call. Either psychically we've done it by ESP and PK, and we've made the telephone ring through the, the bell system, 100 beats per minute in the old Bakelite phones, and then hallucinated the, the voices. There was even someone um, in a book called Hidden Voices about hallucinations, Robert Baker, said that, you know, if you're bereft, you might have some form of intentional amnesia where you start to, you know, a sales company rings you up talking about double glazing or trying to sell you something else, and you've lost a child, and you start pretending that it's their voice just because you're so Ooh. bereft. So you're hallucinating over the top of it or something else. Um, or, you know, on the very end of the scale, if you can push all these other ideas out of the way successfully, you know, what theory are we trying to pose for the dead manipulating the phone? You have, you know, Holton cases with poltergeist activity and manipulation of the electrical system. Was the telephone that far away from you? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. You all still there? Yeah. Um, yep. You're frozen. We get you're frozen. Um, hmm. We'll give it a minute. It might just be a lag or a little problem with the feed. Can you hear us, Cal? Maybe we lost him. See, we got too far deep into the telephone call. <laughs> yeah. get disconnected. They didn't want him yeah. to tell the secret. Mm. Uh, well, um, if it's easy, maybe uh, try to reconnect. Yeah, I will. Yeah, I can tell him to drop out and come back in if he needs to. And yep, I think he dropped out. So we'll give him a little yeah. bit of time here to see if he can. Okay. I just sent him a message to see if he can come back in. Um, there, he dropped out. He, he'll try to come back in. So, yeah, technology is great when it works. And <laughs> nope, there he is. Let me add oh, him perfect. Back He's back. There we got you. See, I'm telling you, you started talking about telephone calls from the dead. They didn't want you to let their secrets go, so they disconnected you. <laughs> Need a glass right now. Are you there, Grandma? There we go. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so uh, let's get into that. Was, that was the theory they were posing. They, they were looking at this paraphysical theory and are these voices kind of in the, the atmosphere like they felt sometimes in the seance room when people had heard voices or are they somehow manipulating the electrical system of the telephone? And there were some early accounts of mediums using actually the telephone as their medium where they would pick it up and hear voices huh. and other things like that. So we're just posing ideas. And in my book, I kind of talked about those and extended them. I talked about people that had tried to develop telephones to contact the dead. Um, F.R. Melton, Francis Grierson, 
Um, even Thomas Edison in his famous interview and what was that really all about? Did he really intend to make such a telephone or is it because other people around that time claimed that they did and it was successful? Was he jumping on the bandwagon? It's remarkable the amount of people that were trying these things around about 1918 through to the early 1920s. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. All right. All do, right. You have, do you have any questions? Um, I don't think we Not can. on that topic. <laughs> I think Kat had one comment was okay. about something you were talking about as you were going through there. Attila von Zille, yeah, that's where it all started with um, Scott Rogo and Raymond Bayliss. Mm -hmm. um, that, that, that was the, the early studies of EVP. Raymond Bayliss was working with his um, astral projector called Attila von Zille, and they okay. they sorted out an apartment in California. They'd soundproofed it, and they were using reel-to-reel uh, -reel recorders in soundproof booths. And uh, it was the idea that Attila von Zille was trying to project his voice in silence onto the magnetic tape or somehow allow the spirits to do it. And they got bangs, raps, taps, scratches, and some whispers of voice on playback. So that's where it all came from, hmm. aside from Attila's own experiences that he reported. But he was used as an EVP subject. Okay. Okay. In, uh, uh, just a quick question. Um, in, the, um, in the book, is... Are you related most mostly to um, being awake or sleep related uh, telephone calls? Awake, definitely. Awake. I mean, some, okay. some people wake up to hearing their phone ring. They might have like an experience in their dream, and then ironically, when they wake up, the phone's lit up and they've got a, a missed call, but from an okay. unknown number. Or maybe it was the fact that their phone wasn't on silent. It rang. It got incorporated in their dream. So you have some of those mix-ups. But a lot of the really striking cases, people are again, they're going about their daily business, and the phone rings, and so okay. it plays out like any other call. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and the comment, uh, Dr. Gary Schwartz is working on one now. The soul phone. Yep, that's mm. it. And you see sp uh, sporadic updates on that. It'd be interesting to see. Uh, what if anything gets published there and what they're finding that should be <laughs> that should be fun i'm just sitting back and watching that play out <laughs> yeah, a lot of people are i think so interesting <laughs> all right moving on to our next topic um a recent publication the journal of parapsychology um you co-authored here as well uh performance of a precognitive remote viewing task with and without gansfeld stimulation three experiments which i think that entire issue of that journal was dedicated to gansfeld yeah. work and it looks like it's still going on strongly mm -hmm. and the effect sizes are obviously a uh, slightly bigger when you use Gansfeld in a lot of ESP studies, Psi studies. So could mm -hmm. you talk a little bit about the study that you participated in and published and uh, what you found? Yeah, I mean, uh, Professor Chris Rowe wanted to combine what we'd done. I mean, technically there were four because we had a, a pilot study in 2007. Mm -hmm. I say we, I was only involved in one of the studies, but that's why I was a co-author. I did the, the 2010 study. Um, so it was the first proper study after the pilot where we had a control condition as well. Mm -hmm. So the one with Chris Flint um, was uh, adopting the Gansfeld and there would be several places on campus. And Chris would go out and get, um, or Stuart, um, a couple of students that were friends. One would go in the Gansfeld um, after knowing a location to think about on campus. They've been selected, one of them randomly. We had like the library, a rugby pitch. Um, a bird aviary and a few other things. Um, it's weird. We had just this whole aviary just full of exotic birds on campus. It was very strange. <laughs> I don't even know what it was for. I mean, it was weird, but um, it's just nice to look at. But um, that, so while they know, knew what the target was and they'd obviously been there, they could picture in their mind going to. Um, oh no! Sorry, sorry. It's the other way around. Um, so the person in the Gansfeld knows nothing. They just know their friend is going to go to one of these locations, mm. and so they did. They went and they were, they were told to just interact. Just go to that location, wander around, walk across the grass on the rugby pitch. If you go to the library, God forbid, pick up a book and read it. Um, <laughs> just do something, interact with the library. And, and think about your friend that you know is in the Gansfell booth. And so while they're in the Gansfell, they're getting all these thoughts and images and so forth. And um, afterwards, their impressions were then um, shown against the decoys to an independent judge. And it was shown to be successful that within that, it seems that the information coming forward would marry up the location the person was at. When we took it forward, we had the Gansfeld again, but we were using Google Earth that had just become really good at that point where you could zoom down into locations and go and interact, especially if people had used um, personal cameras before 
camera phones really became good, but personal cameras that had a link to satellite as well. So it would know on your camera where you are in the world. And sometimes you could allow it to save some of those photos to Google Earth. So if you were taking just scenery photos in Rome or places like that, mm -hmm. it would then add to Google Earth what that person stood at that location could see from their angle through the camera. So you could, when you went on Google Earth, you could tap on some of these camera angles that tourists had taken just to see what things looked like from different spots. So it was a precognitive task. There was no sender in this case. You were just purely working with the location. So you'd on a flip of a coin, the participant would go in and they'd do two trials. And they'd either first do the Gansfeld and try and get all these thoughts and images to come to them. We'd write it down. They'd do some drawings maybe afterwards and then finish. And then in the other condition, we were working off the remote viewing method by Major Paul Smith, where there was a series of things to go through. You work off what seems to be a grid reference. You're using a coordinate. Then you do an ideogram, which was like a bit of automatic drawing. See if that drawing relates to anything. You write down about textures and colors, metallic, sandy, yellow, open, vast, all these different um, ideas to help you build up what the, the place is like. And then you do some drawings as well. And um, so afterwards, when they were done, they then go through to uh, Professor Rowe's office and the computer, after they had done, was a button would get hit. And after the random selection of all the different places, it would pick one and that would be the target. So there's no way we could know either because the target itself was a future prediction. It hadn't happened yet. So for both trials, all of that feedback then went to an independent judge. They saw the uh, target and three possible decoys as well. And they had to look at that feedback and say, which one rank ordering out of four does it best match to? For all of the Gansfeld conditions throughout all of the three trials, including fourth, the Chris Blimp one as well, they were all successful. They were um, significant with good effect sizes. It hmm. didn't really happen for the remote viewing trial. So with, without that induction, altering your state of consciousness, it doesn't seem to happen. It marries back to uh, what Dr. Jessica Utz has said, that if you take a random group of the population, take 100 people, only one out of 100 seem to be naturally good at ESP tests. And hmm. that's also how they followed it through with the military trials as well for remote viewing. Hmm. Okay, interesting. interesting. So do you think it's a signal to noise ratio by reducing the actual noise consciousness noise that you're able to pick up better and do better with these tasks that that's the idea that chuck honiton was trying to push which is why we refer to it as the noise reduction model so you've got all these day-to-day -day things going on you've got new forms of communication your iphones your ipads the internet social media and yet people still have these after-death communications they have a premonition of something before it happens there are many of titanic there are many of 9 11 there are many of the tsunami um, there are some of COVID-19 as well. Um, some of them are a case of, you know, you you know shoot enough times at the target, you're bound to hit the bullseye if you're just firing off round after round. But some of them are, you know, one hit and it, it's hit right on the target. And it's so specific as well. Many of the details are very detailed and they don't seem to be like some of these other ones where someone's just saying, you know, take 9-11, just, oh, I see a plane crashing into a building. Okay, well, how many other times have you dreamt of that and how many other times have your other dreams like that as well? Something more specific, though, seeing two planes and one thing crashing down after the other, big, tall, high buildings. There's lots of when it gets more detailed, it seems more specific. But these are day to day things that seem to come out. But with the Gansfeld, you take anyone and put them in a situation where all these day to day noises are closed off and all they can focus on is a pink haze over their eyes when they've got the eye shields on, they're hearing static and their thoughts are just coming to them, but they know they've got something to focus on potentially. Then these hallucinations come to the forefront and they seem to be very interesting, especially when we compare them to the targets. Hmm. Wow. That's interesting. Yeah, I was. Uh, we did some work with Joey Caswell, who was a graduate student in Michael Pershinger's lab. And he had a group together that we were a part of for a while. I think it was the Trans Anomaly Research Team or some fancy name. Everybody has to have a name these days. I guess. <laughs> and a T-shirt. Oh, yeah. yeah. And a t <laughs> we, we do not have black T-shirts that we are, wear around. It. So that's a plus for us. Uh, and there was uh, Dr. Miguel Guiona down, uh, I think he was in Mexico at the time, and he had started the Premonitions Project. And what he was trying to do is collect things like you were talking about the 9-11 and people would have dreams of planes hitting buildings or other things that would happen. And he was encouraging people to go in and enter them into the da database online and then going back and hopefully doing some formal statistical analysis and publications in the future. Now, I don't know if he's still doing that or if the website's even still active, but it, it was a 
interesting way to try to get at is there really something to this? Because as you said, some people say, okay, sure, you dre you dreamt of a car accident. Well, okay, you had a car accident the next day, but how many times do people, how many humans over the course of uh, one night or even 365 nights dream of a car accident and it happens or it doesn't happen? What's the chance expectation of that happening? So mm -hmm. he was trying to get at that. I'm not quite sure if that's still um, going on, but that was an interesting effort on those ends as well. I mean, the, the American SPR said around that time that they were collecting such cases, but by the late 1990s, they'd started to become very quiet. And I'm sure if either of you have researched that, it's a very kind of dodgy area. I, I don't know what's happening. And there's a lot of people that want something to happen because um, all kinds of articles are coming out about them and their tax returns are being made public. It's a very dodgy area, but yeah. still the, um, the, the research they said they were doing would have been very interesting had right in the middle of New York City, they're collecting these very accounts of something that's happened literally there. Um, what was going on? But in other cases, though, they've been quite remarkable. Some people have taken stuff from that. So Dr. Richard Brown gave a lecture to the Parapsychology Foundation when it was still in New York City, yes. about six years after 9-11 happened. But even then, he managed to look at some basic stats on it and showed that if it wasn't 3,000, it was 6,000 people. It was it was in the thousands. Mm. Um, people didn't die in 9-11 that should have done by their day-to-day -day commutes in there. And mm. when you ask some of these people, well, what happened that day? Things got in their way. They acted uncharacteristically, things stopped them. Um, even part-time workers that said they were sticklers for going in, they loved working in the trade centers. Mm -hmm. And um, they just decided to go in that afternoon and just clean the flat, clean the house, you know, get on with some of the things that they wanted to do. And this even happened going all the way back to the Titanic as well. Um, I read one of the initial reports from 1912, 1913, where I, I, I found it hard to believe, but then they were breaking it down again, similar to 9-11, where it was in the thousands again of people saying that they had avoided death. And yet their capacity at the time they sank was two and a half thousand. And you think, well, how come that many people avoided it? People at the time were very superstitious about maiden voyages. So they avoided going on the maiden voyage. Other people had just felt really bad working on the Titanic and some had transferred from the Olympic at sister ship and hated working on that as well. No idea why, they just felt bad. Things went wrong initially that put people off. There'd been a fire on board the Titanic um, during a gala dinner in its opening thing. A table had collapsed for no reason. All these kinds of things added to people's superstition of maritime. And um, some people are just avoided. Other people were lucky where the things had got in their way and stopped them getting on or they got off in, in Ireland before then it crossed the Atlantic. But it was in the thousands. Some studies did take place with these kinds of things in the 1950s regarding uh, train commutes by a researcher called Cox. And he found that looking at day-to-day -day commutes on trains, even taking into account weather conditions, so rainy days when you might take your car or you might hitch a lift with a neighbor, there was still a statistically significant drop of ticket sales on days that there were crashes and major hmm. fatalities. So oh. somehow people are acting unconsciously, potentially, on these just unusual feelings and acting on it has saved their life. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, Great. that's fantastic. Hmm. All right. Well, we're coming up on an hour. So I think, uh, Jen, unless you have any follow up questions on uh, Anfield and remote viewing, uh, into the no, next topic. Right okay. So you've been involved in some parapsychological archival work, trying to collect a variety of different resources and putting them into one location. And I think there was just a recent update on, let me grab my piece of paper here in the paranormal review. There was a quick update on what you've been doing, uh, and that was following up, uh, I think, a 2014 article in the same publication, mm, yeah. uh, introducing people to the work that you were doing there. So uh, what's that What's that all about? What are you hoping to accomplish there? I mean, my passion is for books and journals. And, um, well, the we can't tell with what's behind you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> with, the, with the physical stuff. Um, and some of it, we, we have this thing, again, in academia where – you know, if you publish in an open access journal, fantastic, because then everyone is aware instantly. They can just find it online and they can read that paper. Not many journals, though, subscribe to an open access policy. You either have to pay for it or get the university to pay for that individual paper to forevermore be open access if you put it on the mm. university system, uh, which sometimes can cost a lot of money. But we did that with the recent remote viewing paper. Um, the university paid for that to be open access. Mm -hmm. Um, but some journals will never be um, open access. So the SPR, all of its old proceedings and stuff like that, you can get it um, by being a member and they've got the online library. But for a lot of journals, if you don't pay somehow for the privilege of being able to access that journal, 
how do you keep it going? Because there's the editor and assistant editor to pay and the review sure. board and people typesetting it. So this is why this happens. So sometimes I think, you know what, there is still a need for the books. I'm forever still going through these books mm -hmm. um, and many other ones as well. I've got loads of journals over here, ones that I know will never, ever be digitized. And they're not even digitized in any format to even for paid membership get access. You've got to go to the libraries that hold them. So I've even collected some myself. So I know I've got them to hand now and then, though, we digitize them. But I'm trying to make sure that at least starting with the University of Northampton, We've got full runs of things just because we get people uh, that come to do a psychology degree. They do parapsychology. They've mm -hmm. got as far access as possible to all the things um, instead of going to London to the SPR office or the College of Psychic Studies or to the University of Cambridge to go to their archive. We've got everything we need within the building. Mm -hmm. um, and so the latest stuff that I had, I mean, I'm trying to expand our journal of the American Society for Psychical Research. So oh, where are we? Cameras the opposite way. These ones here. <laughs> These have been donated from uh, one of the parapsychology archives in uh, the Netherlands. And so that's wow. um, journals from the 1960s because we were missing mm. those. We actually lost a load in our campus move, which was just traumatizing for me. Oh. Um, and so I've been trying to build those back up. We've had donations of the Journal of Parapsychology and other ones and bit by bit. And then the university sends them off for binding. I mean, this is like what I've done as well, just to preserve them longer. So if you get stuff from the SPR through the post, it looks like that as a paperback. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the entire volume, I've had it bound together in, in Ooh, one nice. book to kind of look like the other ones as well. Just mm -hmm. makes it last longer over time, so long as no one's, you know, borrowing it constantly. And that never happens at the uni. Mm. Journals are a reference, shelf reference only. You look at it, you photocopy it, you put it back. Um, but also trying to get students to appreciate the, the whole point of this. I mean, the librarians love me because they get more and more students trying to just purely go down the digital route of doing everything. And they're trying to kind of keep up and say, look, do bear in mind, though, as much as we can digitize things for you, not everything is or ever will be digitized. There's more stuff in print than there is on the Internet right. um, in terms of the, the topic base. So, you know, you've got to appreciate if you want to be a scholar or go down the scholarly route, you've got to mix up the two. Do your Internet searches, find things, find references and then follow them up or do the opposite way. Look in the books mm -hmm. and then go and do a trawl on the Internet. The two work together really, really well. Um, but, you know, for things like parapsychology, we've learned very well that now we, we have all these strange encyclopedia sites, and I won't name the specific one I'm thinking of, there's extremely biased information out there that is purposefully misleading. The, they've even got dedicated groups on that page explaining what they do regarding those topic areas and how they edit them. Um, and so, uh, like the latest book I've written a forward for, Psy Wars, Ted, Wikipedia, and the back of, bat well, I've said it now, Battle for the Internet. <laughs> we um, all know what you mean. We kind of knew. Yeah. <laughs> we all knew. Uh, Craig Weiler, he's, uh, he's updated it, and um, I, I wrote the forward and, and kind of scanned it past Professor Chris Rowe, kind of looking at our own experiences with the students, because last five years, more and more students rely on their iPhones. You ask them something, they're not sure of something, people reach for their iPhone, they quickly Google it. Mm -hmm. You Google it, one of the first things you get is a popular encyclopedia. Mm -hmm. And it can be very misleading. Basic definitions, quotes, some dates from and to of death and birth, they can be fairly good. But even when I've looked at bios of parapsychologists, I found even dates of birth to death are wrong. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's not the best source of information. You need to do some proper scholarly work and research if you want to know something. Go to the books. I learned that when I went on my career path to parapsychology. I started with the library and I learned that even though I wasn't interested in reading, if I wanted to know the topic, there was no good documentaries on parapsychology at the time. The internet wasn't really born. I had to read the books. And that's where the information was coming from. And when it did integrate into the digital format, I saw the corruption happening. And, and that, oh my God, you know, this information is becoming very misleading. So this is why I'm so passionate about archiving and preserving history. Yeah, and that's that's true. There's there's a lot of digital information. There's a lot of social media. There's a lot of things. Anybody can put anything on the internet mm. or see yeah. it on TV well, and think that's the way it is. And then you try to counter that with here's a journal article out of a, a here's a peer reviewed published study in a mainstream journal, and everybody mm. says, "Oh, great! Can you give me that?" I'm like. <laughs> Well, I'd like to, one, I'm not supposed to because I d paid for it and downloaded it for my personal use and I can't send it to you, mm. but you can go here and download it for $45. Mm. So in order to counter the bad information, you need to have access to the good scientific, well-researched information, but that's cost prohibitive. Mm -hmm. I mean, I look at just getting, a, you know, the Journal of Scientific Exploration and 
uh, Journal of Parapsychology and a couple others. And, you know, you're probably talking north of $300, $300 plus a year just in subscription oh, yeah. fees to get that. Not everybody can do that. No. So, yeah, no. It, it's nice to have those resources available where people can go and actually get good information and, and study and learn the field. That's one of the main things we're always pushing is mm -hmm. if you want to know what's going on really. And, you know, if you're a paranormal investigator, ghost hunter, or whatever you want to call yourself, if you really want to know what's been going on, you need to go back and look at the work of the SPR, the American SPR, what parapsychologists are doing what what the real research is, but they just don't have access to that type of information. Mm -hmm. I mean, some's on there, but as you say, not everything. Um, we're trying to kind of work on this. We're trying to get better rates for students at conferences. Even with the journal, I think one of the last council meetings we have for the SPR was trying to look at making everything, everything that it's done open access bar the past two years. So it's always two years ahead if you've got membership. So you're getting the exclusive access to the most recent stuff. Yeah, um, so that, that, that might... yeah a scientific exploration has done that. It's like the, la the last three years you still need to pay for, but everything yeah. prior to that is open access now. So they might be a move in the right direction, but it, it also kind of makes me think again of, um, you know, the argument that I had on social media, there were at least four or five people that their main argument was in response to, is there any good evidence for psychic phenomena? That some people responded, no, there isn't actually any evidence for psychic phenomena whatsoever. And I said, what are you basing mm -hmm. that on? And some yeah. people would say, well, I'm a magician, I'm a you know professional conjurer, and and so I know that it isn't because I've copied this. And I said, just because you can copy something doesn't mean to say it's the original item. I can bake a cake because you've given me the recipe. It's not the one you made. It's the mm -hmm. one I've copied from your recipe. It is not the same process. I need to see the original thing to know what yours tastes like compared to mine. So that there's all that. And um, yeah. It, it's just a bit of a strange argument, but when you actually start to say where all the material is, it makes some people angry. I remember being at a house party once when someone asked me, what do I do for a living? And I always think carefully, do I say psychologist or do today I say parapsychologist because I'm up for an argument? <laughs> <laughs> oh, do we lose you? Oh, I've got you back. Oh, no, we still got <laughs> Goat in the machine again. Mm -hmm. um, you know, or do I say parapsychologist? And one time I remember at this garden party, I said parapsychologist, and this guy got really angry. And he said, isn't that about ghosts and psychics? And I said, well, you know, in a very crude nutshell, it is, yeah. yeah. And he said, uh, that's all nonsense. And I said, what do you mean? He said, there's no evidence for any of that. And I said, well, I can assure you with it being my main income, <laughs> my day-to-day -day job, and, you know, educating other people and, you know, supervising PhDs and other doctorates, it, yeah. there is a lot of evidence for it. Mm -hmm. um, whether, whether it turns out to be what we think it is, um, you know, that's a different matter, but it's all pointing in that direction as far as we are in science right now. And he said, no, there isn't. I said, look, well, you know, if you're that, you know, kind of tense about it, you're more than welcome. Anytime you're in Northampton, you know, take my number, come and have a coffee. I'll treat you to coffee. I'll give you a tour of the building. And I can just leave you with the books. You're more than welcome to peruse the journals because mm -hmm. we've got thousands of studies. He got so angry, he just took his uh, wife and left the party. Hmm. That's not good. Yeah. They're not right. Sometimes they're, if, if they can't prove you wrong, then they get upset. I can, I've oh, no. I we've experienced that too. Yeah, I think we. Froze. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Is it? He left. Oh, that was that was the end of the story. He left uh, the party. Okay. He got so angry. Well, a little yeah. little cognitive dissonance there. They can't can't handle it. It clashes yeah. with what they believe, and they get a little upset. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. So well, great. It was uh, boy, that hour and ten minutes went by mm -hmm. really fast. And we touched upon a lot of really great topics. Appreciate your time. And where can no people go to find out more about you or the research you do or, or what you're going to be up to next? So I'll mention some of these because Telephone Calls from the Dead is out of print. I need to sort something out. But there's a whole chapter in Paracoustics on telephone anomalies, which I've edited with Steve Parsons. So if you want to know a bit about it, it's in here along with some really interesting chapters that are uh, quite a mix up it's not a read it from cover to cover it's select mm. your chapter you're interested and dive straight in there um i've done archival research as well you can find bits of information um on me through the alex tanis foundation and their website when you google them but these are things i've worked on he had an unpublished book called conversations with ghosts and one called oh, that's strange there we go sign mm. psychotherapy <laughs> um so i've been putting books together as well manuscripts that never got finished off so those are some of the things I've been working on. I'm still working on a few other manuscripts, including a biography to Alex Tannis and also Scott Rogo mm -hmm. as well. Um, but if you go to my website, mm -hmm. it's www. If people still say that now, Callum E, my middle initial, Cooper. Callum E. Cooper. 
Um, and then I also have a Twitter page that's just at Callum E. Cooper as well. That usually has a lot of posts about the university and things I'm doing and, and writing about. And those are the main ways to look at what I'm doing. And, and now and then when lockdown isn't happening, when I'm out doing talks, sometimes I'll post on there where things are happening. I, I think the last big event that I did that got a lot of attention was, was last December when I talked about Christmas ghosts. And I was talking about the, the history of it in religion and then also uh, the boom in literature around it as well. Charles Dickens from A Christmas Carol through to The Signalman and a few other things like that. And it was really good. I was dressed in period costume and I'd, I'd done up a stage a little bit to talk about seances. It was just such a fun night to do something like that around Christmas mm -hmm. and get people to appreciate literature around that time, story reading, ghost stories at Christmas. Um, so it was really good. Something I want to do at the university later on, maybe this year, and, and revisit that. Um, but that's where people can find out about me and get in contact as well. Okay. All right. And I uh, just wanted to put it out there that uh, all the information that we have talked to Cal about today will be listed on our website as well um, for under the uh, resources site. So all the books um, that he's showed us and such, they'll all be there. Fantastic. All right. Well, great. Well, thanks for joining us, uh, Dr. Callum Cooper. We appreciate it. Our guests appreciate it. And it was a great conversation. I learned a lot, as I always do, talking mm -hmm. to uh, different guests. And thank you again. And we're going to sign off. And if you can just hold on for a couple of minutes, we'll chat briefly afterwards. Great. Thanks, everyone.